to uh, the second part of the screening, Josie and Pussycats. You were just saying that you were surprised that there's a film cut. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, first of all, thanks for coming, everybody. <laughs> this 20 year old movie. Um, no, I was just surprised that it was an actual print because I think, yeah, there are not many prints that exist. Uh, partly because there was a fire in Universal where lots of things got destroyed. Is that the one that also destroyed a lot of the, the music masters? Yes. Oh, interesting. Uh, I think some prints may have gone up there. The I, may, I may be making that up too, but I'm going to say that might be the case. Uh, and one of the bummers is we did, because as the directors, you keep, they offer you to, you can buy a print of the movie. And we were like, eh. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe it had come out already. But, um, the fun thing about this is I can't remember anything ever, any day of the week. So Harry can say anything right now and be like, oh, yeah, is that <laughs> Well, now's the time to uh, make a new narrative, I guess. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, we did not buy uh, prints, so. Um, so you guys worked together on Can't Hardly Wait, but how did you get attached? <laughs> so how did you guys end up working on a movie about an Archie Comics fictional girl band with uh, ear head um, cat ear headbands and tails? Though they don't wear tails in the movie. They do have tails. They do sometimes, oh, not always, but they sometimes see have tails. When they're, when they, uh, they're holding them at some point. They're very long. <laughs> like they're like six. Like, and when we had them in these, I don't know if you guys know what please or shoes are, but they're like the shoes that strippers wear. With the big blue side bottoms, and it's just it's death defying every day for them running around in their shoes, tripping on the tails. In terms of how we wound up doing this, <laughs> um, two memories on that bad. <laughs> I forgot your question. Um, <laughs> Now I forgot the question. Um, so we, uh, yeah, we uh, can't hardly wait. We were working on a couple. We were working on a script that we thought we might want to do after can't hardly wait. And somebody, uh, uh, it was clear that kind of wasn't going to get made in the movie. And somebody approached us with this idea of a Jesse and Pussycats movie, which we very quickly said that that's just no, that's absurd. Uh, and we laughed it off. And then, because honestly, it's not like I was a big. Uh, you read more Archie comics than I did. I wasn't a huge fan of. Characters, I remember the Saturday morning cartoon from when we were kids. That was my only kind of knowledge of the show, which at the time seemed almost like a ripoff of Scooby Doo um, on the TV version. Uh, and so we kind of left it off, and then they came back to us again saying, Really? I mean, you kind of do whatever you want with this. We don't have any real parameters. And that was when we kind of had the idea that, wait a second, this is a, this is a band. It's a story about a band, which means we can actually make a musical which sounded too irresistible. It's like, we're gonna be a studio, we, they, they just don't make this anymore. A uh, studio back to musical, so that's when we thought, all right, maybe we should take this more seriously. Or not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, uh, the satire in the movie about the music industry is so spot on in the most depressing way. Um, like when there's the du jour commemorative box set and uh, they're only missing, they've only been a band for a year, I feel like that's something you would totally write up on pitchwork.com. <laughs> but um, did you guys have any experience in the music industry? Or like, how did you build out this world? Well, I think, you know, we were just fans. We were always music fans. And we came up, you know, in college with, you know, Nirvana and, you know, like right shortly thereafter, you know, like Pearl Jam and Alice in Chains. And, Rage, all the bands we were fans of, and suddenly, like, it felt like all of those things were getting, like, just pushed aside, and we were being thrown a new boy band every week. And it was weird, it was like, it seemed almost like it was a conspiracy, just the deluge of, like, bands with NSYNC, LFO, Backstreet Boys, 98 Degrees, I'm sure I'm forgetting some, but there were so many, and it was, like, just being forced on everybody. Um, and it felt like it was like a, like a real um, dedicated attempt to, to just get rid of any individuality and any dissent. Um, and it felt like an interesting, you know, we like to bite the hand that feeds us. It does not do well for our careers, but, <laughs> you know, it felt like it was something that was worth exploring. Um, I guess to that end, like, 
Who, how did you envision Josie and Melody and Valerie? Like, to me, they are clearly connected to like the Baruch Assault and like Letters to Cleo. Obviously, Kay Handley did Josie's voice, but um, yeah, how did you envision these women who are like, like their wacky house and their friendship and their feminism and all of those things? I mean, a lot of it comes just from the story. You know, it's like the dictates of the story. Because if we want to tell a story about, you know, how these girls are very individualistic, they're, they're not kind of swayed by this kind of consumer culture that's everywhere else in the movie, it all kind of grew from there, like their house. It's like, okay, so we wanted to do, you know, the idea was to do like a very kind of almost Tim Burton neighborhood where everything looks exactly the same, like the uh, kind of Edward Scissorhands neighborhood, which we couldn't really afford to do. But, um, but in contrast to that, they need to have like a super perky house and, you know, it looks uh, like, a, like an eyesore, but they love it. So that's kind of where that came from. And then in terms of the, the lead characters, you know, we had the, the basic template from the comic book and the cartoon, um, but then again, it just kind of went from story from there. It's like, okay, they're gonna try and separate them when they get in the city, and they're gonna pit them against each other, and you know, that it seemed like, okay, so Val is then gonna have to be the one who gets left out, and then this melody kind of is too, she's not really aware. <laughs> so, it kind of, so everything kind of came together that way. Yeah, and um, were they always like a, funky rock band, or, yeah. <laughs> there was never a uh, Josie and the Pussycats folk. <laughs> <laughs> the only, um, the only thing we talked about was at some point when we were auditioning Val's, um, famously, Beyonce came in and we said, no, nah, not talented enough. Um, and, <laughs> and uh, Left Eye from TLC came in and she, Yes, and, she, and it was a, you know, Aaliyah came in too. It was a very strange, um, tragic. Yeah, it wasn't our fault. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, so and Kenny Evans, who did who produced the soundtrack, was excited about the idea of Left Eye because he thought, well, now it can kind of change the music and we can do a we, we like a song instead of a guitar, guitar solo and a rap break. And she could really kind of use her skills, but ultimately she wasn't really right for the part. And it's just, Rosario walks into a room and she has that, it's just this other world thing. Like she glows from within, there's no way that, and we really, I think she had to kind of wait to see if she'd come to the movie. It was not an easy get, like she had, was, she had a lot of choices at the time and we really had to get her. Yeah, I feel like in the opening montage where they're introducing the characters and she's, she's doing like charity work and, rock climbing and everything. You're like, wow, who is this girl? She's so cool. <laughs> or at least that's how I feel. But um, I would <laughs> love to see Beyonce do her interpretation. <laughs> um, I, I uh, when Du Jour came on, there was a lot of applause. I think they have really came out of this movie. They came out of this movie and definitely stole people's hearts with their just dumb cuteness and all those things. But um, earlier you were talking about the deluge of boy bands, but I think the characters in Du Jour are like, they're so spot on, the um, every, the individual facial expression, the, the monkey, which is very like Justin Bieber, Michael Jackson, <laughs> like every rock star is gonna have a monkey at some point. And then like the, the butt slap hand shake is very like, <laughs> I feel like fan fiction would definitely be written about that today. <laughs> Maybe there has been, I don't know. Um, but so you were kind of expressing maybe a distaste for those sort of acts, but did you, how did you do your like field research for creating du jour and <laughs> writing those songs? Writing the songs was hilarious because you realized that you could make us, you could make anything into a song. It did, we think we wrote "Du Jour Around the World" in the back of a car, like heading from one location to another. And the lyrics are like, that's a first draft. Like nobody writes the lyrics. Du Jour, ride on your motorbike at Du Jour. Sure, but we didn't really try because it didn't seem like those. They were not trying; they were just breaking those songs out. And a lot of you know, a lot of it like, you can tell they're sort of molded off of guys from other. Les is clearly, uh, what's his name, from Kevin, Kevin from Backstreet Boys, and he put up a little 
<laughs> the thoughtfulness and Seth were like, he's she always had one accessory to me, like you should do the top hat and the boa, like he was like the one thing behind. Um, and then just putting those guys together because we've known them all for so long. I don't, I guess, I don't know. Is that your name? Not yet. The following year. Oh, okay. So Greg and I were together then, and then, you know, Seth, we've known Seth forever, and Donald, they had done Can't Hardly Wait, um, and Alex was always around, and they just have this great chemistry when they all get together. They're so much fun, and they're so funny, and then putting them with Alan, like, a lot of that just sort of came about on the day. It was written, but, like, the handshakes and... And they also, I mean, because I remember Rebecca specifically was a fan. You know, it's not like these guys were looking at these boy bands thinking like, oh, this is so stupid. Like, he loved that insignia. video. Like, learn the dance from the insignia. video. I want to defend him even though we're not married anymore. <laughs> when I met him, he had like 27 Pearl Jam t-shirts and one pair of jeans. And, that was all, and he lived in like a full time and his whole life was Pearl Jam. Um, but he goes deep on things. So he like, there was a year he was super into Garth Brooks and like, he was really into Garth Brooks. It's not, it's, yes, he probably did go do one in sync, not in the way I just said it. <laughs> That's going to wind up on Twitter. Back to home. <laughs> Goes into custody of the kids. to make fun of all the branding and the shitty logos everywhere. It just felt like, again, like this alternate world that wasn't really that alternate, but just heightened. Um, so at the very beginning, the question was, are we gonna use real brands, or are we just gonna use, because one of the examples totally we talked about was The Simpsons at the time, it was kind of like one of the few satires that was kind of very, uh, that everybody was watching. Uh, and they do similar things, but they make up their own brands, like Larry Cigarettes or Duff Beer, and you know, it's very kind of pointed, but we thought it's just, Funnier and to us it seems sharper to use the real companies. Let's use the real logos that we're used to seeing, um, which in reviews and movie people complained about. Um, but it was less a matter of like, uh, it was really it's like who, who's going to let us use their logo? Um, because we were kind of saying things <laughs> that were very anti corporate. Um, and some people were game to play, they're like, great, put the logo on the, sh on, on the movie, and other people. Like uh, famously, the Gap at the time had a had a their whole campaign in the early to late in nineties, early two thousands was everybody in whatever denim, everybody in leather. So it was like, oh, that's exactly what the movie is. So when Josie comes out of the hair salon and looks up the billboard, it was supposed to be a Gap billboard that said everybody in leather. And we're like, oh, that's so great. And the Gap was like, no fucking way. <laughs> so, so it became an NRL. There's a, what, is there like an AOL hotel? I feel like there's yeah. there's another AOL thing in the movie. It's actually a state map board, and it's an AOL, the AOL hotel. Exactly. Look, I remember some of you guys. <laughs> Sorry to put up your spot. <laughs> um, I guess something we were talking about earlier was, or outside was uh, that you guys you, Harry, were wondering, you have some of the, the little bathing, McDonald's bathing toys, <laughs> but you can't find the french fry one. Can't find the french fries. By the way, they're not meant to be shower toys. Those were just like little plush giveaways from McDonald's that we thought, oh, we'll put them in the shower and she'll use one of them as a sponge, but you don't know where the fries are. Yeah. The it's shake and the bird right are exactly where they are. <laughs> and that kind of led to a discussion of other, uh, the where are they now of other costumes and props. I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit because I found it very delightful. <laughs> okay, I have Josie's guitar. Oh. And I have the ears on the leather headband and I have a tail. Mm -hmm. And 
that's all. I think that's all I made off of. Oh, I had an M's guitar, and I did not know what happened to it. It's not really it playable. Apart. It has like a. It had like a like rebar inside. It's not really. It was like a like a arts guitar, like a Frankenstein. I have the uh, the the drum head from the the Pussycat drum head. <laughs> Um, the Blue Pistol the Sex Pistols logo. Um, and I had a box full of things also that I just put in my garage when I moved. And one of the things in there was with a Coke can that has Marco's picture on it. I'm not sure what it Coke can. And Coke actually made real cans for us that had actual Coke inside so you could open it. And I didn't think about it until I looked at that box 20 years later or 50 years later, and it had exploded. And I'm glad that whoever put it in that box had put it inside a Ziploc bag because it was disgusting. And unfortunately, uh, I had to throw the whole thing out. Oh, you were in the Panther Bus Pass. Aww. Oh, Dude. Yeah, I found it in the box when I was getting the photos out for Russ at Panther Bus Pass. Amazing. Yeah, that, that had been missing for a long time. Oh, that's really sweet. <laughs> I love that moment so much. Um, there, are, I also read that there, well, actually before I ask that, um, there's so much uh, winking and breaking the fourth wall and uh, real, like, poking fun at uh, <laughs> the, the quote-unquote man for this movie. Where, was the studio ever like, you need to tone this down? Never. I mean, <laughs> it was a very different time. Like, the universe was making a lot more movies than they make now. The budget for this movie was not very big. I mean, it's been, we've read, it's been inflated over the years. It was under a $30 million movie, which at the time to us was a ton of money, but to Universal then, not, you know, not one of their top, top movies. Um, and Stacey Snyder, who was the head of the studio at the time, to her credit, totally got what we were doing. And she had sent us a copy of Puppy Swope to watch before we went up and made the movie, which is like, you know, a, a biting satire. So she was on board and she knew, so they never said, tone it down, they never said, you know, you're biting the hand. I think that their thing was, how are we gonna sell this? And I don't know if they haven't figured it out, because. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, could you speak a bit about how they did sell it? <laughs> I mean, look, I, Mark, it, it's hard, you know, there are two different departments. I think, you know, there, there's maybe more um, communication between those departments now, but we, I remember we walked in and they, wanted, they had this whole presentation for us of, you know, the poster and all the nonsense and results of the movie, and we walked into, they wanted to show it to us, we walked into this boardroom and it was like, oh, fuck, they don't get it at all. Like, it was all pink and purple, and it looked like they were selling it to 12-year-olds, and we're like, 12-year-olds are not gonna, understand this movie, it's not for them. Um, I mean, for God's sake, since it's how many people have pussy, 30 seconds into the movie. <laughs> <laughs> but they, like, that train had, you know, they start that stuff so far ahead and you don't really get to look at it until it's way too late and the train has left the station and it wasn't the kind of movie and we weren't the kind of directors that could say like, no, 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 you've got it all wrong, we demand you to go back to the square one. We're like, okay, come on. So they come. And, you know, it's also not, you know, it is a movie about them girl band and it's colorful and poppy so you would think yeah we'll sell it to young girls it's not you know there's a we should not know this until way later but there's a famous quote about satire it's theater quote which is uh satire is what closes on saturday night because it's just it's hard to sell and people don't necessarily rush out to see it we didn't realize that when we made the movie yeah um i i mean i guess this is more of a, a philosophical question but i i do wonder sometimes if satire can be made in the moment. Like it's so close to the boy band era ending. And I don't, I mean, it's, I was definitely under 12, I would say, when the movie came out. So maybe it was being marketed to me, but I was not allowed to see it because it was, yeah. it was PG 13. <laughs> um, but I feel like it kind of worked out in hindsight because you have all these people my age or older who really, who, who kind of, Embrace the movie despite maybe how it was marketed, or maybe because of, because it was marketed to them, but you have people like uh, Sadie Dupree from Speedy Ortiz, and like Eva Hendricks from Charlie Bliss, and they, like Charlie Bliss performed that, um, that show where they covered the songs, and I just saw their like opening for uh, Letters to Cleo, so everything, like wow, that's really cool. <laughs> just seeing the Pussycats brings people together. <laughs> it's, it's great, and, you know, we spent an inordinate amount of time licking our wounds and feeling like we could not even show our faces anywhere. And then social media happened, 
And you realize, that, oh, there are a lot of people who really love this movie. There were girls who said, like, I picked up the guitar and started a band with my friends when I saw this movie. And that's major. Like, we can't, we can't deny that that's something great that came out of it. In the moment, you, you felt very disconnected. We did not know, you know, we saw the movie made, you know, zero dollars, and we couldn't find work again. That's all we took away. And it was really, it's actually been really gratifying many years later to see how many people found the movie on their own and, like, made it theirs. I think that there would be applause for that. Just had to wait to be. So I also wanted to ask about um, if there, the I guess Archie Comics overlords, right holders, if they have any ex or like things that you needed, character traits. Anything that needed to be put in the movie that uh, you had to go through with? I mean, Archie's, it was run by a very different group at the time. They were really, I think, just trying to keep the brand alive. It was not like now with Riverdale, and they very, you know, there's a lot of control over the, uh, over the characters and properties. Um, all we were given was a list of things that the Pussycats needed to be seen doing at some point in the movie. <laughs> and one of those things was they need to show that they have good dental hygiene. <laughs> Which is why in the opening montage when we introduce them, they're all brushing their teeth in the mirror. Check! Um, and another one was I think they had to always wear seatbelts. Um, and those are the weird ones I remember. I don't know what the other ones were. I don't think these of posters was one of them. Those guys are not in charge of the rights anymore. Right? No. Yeah, no, so. the rights have ended up in the hands these two guys uh, from New Jersey. We can say this because we're from the Tri State area. Um, and I believe they started with this fight at the premiere. <laughs> like that was sort of like what we were dealing with. So, yeah, we were going to show them brushing their teeth for sure. <laughs> yeah, Josie very uh, expressively spit out her cheeks at one point in that montage. So. That's good dental hygiene. It's a rinse. Um, I also wanted to ask about the uh, the uncredited cameos that we were talking about earlier. If you mean me at the end of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe? <laughs> Which cameos? Sorry. Uh, the the, photo the Rolling Stones. Oh, right, 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 right. Yes. So, yeah, we just had fun with it because Mark Seliger, who was at the time, the, you know, he shot all the covers of Rolling Stones, then he took the photographs of uh, the actresses that went poster and all the advertising, but we had him play the photographer in the Pretend to be Nice montage, so that's Mark Seller taking their pictures and pushing somebody out of the way, having a good time. And then Sally Hershberger, who at the time was the hairstylist to the stars, who kind of, I think, took credit for that kind of choppy, flippy <laughs> haircut that was everywhere that Rachel has in the movie. Um, she, we, we found out she was willing to be in the movie in the, one of the scenes for the montage, so. Yeah, she flew her son, or she flew all over Vancouver as we were scrambling to shoot that day. And we, uh, literally, I think we spent five seconds with her to do the job. We're like, okay, great, thanks. And then we <laughs> ran off. I mean, it's still a movie, so. My favorite kind of no one talks about is Kenny playing the chief from yep. Captain Neal, and sort of brought me to tears in that horribly now racist headdress. Uh, but he was so funny, and he was so committed. It was nice to see him step outside of being you know, Kenny Edmonds, who's so cool. And then, of course, there's the Carson Daly uh, murder. But he, though he is definitely credited, obviously. But um, he and Tara Reid were dating at the time, I think. How, how was that? <laughs> Surprising. I mean, he was so happy to kind of poke fun of himself. I think he didn't, uh, he, he wasn't thrilled. I think that he was kind of seen as like the, that era's Dick Clark. I mean, he was he kind of I think, thought he had more edge than that. So I think he loved the idea of, you know, kind of poke fun of himself and playing a murderer. And, yeah. Yeah. I, I also wanted to ask about um, the way the uh, the three fans, who are fans of everything, uh, are filmed with kind of yeah the fisheye lens and the uh, they look terrifying. <laughs> All very nice. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think we wanted to go for an extreme kind of you know we want to push the style and exaggerate it. So yeah, we shot them. Put a, put a camel right above their noses and they just scream their heads off. The screams are, again, terrifying. Um, 
Would you guys have a favorite moment from filming that you think of? Or at least favorite moment? I don't know. I mean, shooting that concert at the end was just a thrill. Even though you had to sort of, we didn't like coerce people to come. Like, we, we gave a concert by a legit Canadian boy band. It was, it's, I, four want four. Say, I want to say boys for now, but that's the Bob's burger. <laughs> The epic quality of that was a blast for me. Did I steal yours? No, you didn't, but I forgot what I was going to say. Um, oh, well, we, got, we did have a great time when the guys showed up to shoot the Detroit stuff, because that was kind of towards the end of the movie. Because um, we actually shot this stuff with Les when they come back to body cast, obviously, it's not the dudes except for Les. Um, because they weren't available, we had to shoot that stuff out early, because the Parker only worked the first three weeks, three weeks of the movie, I think. Um, so at the end, we shot the tutorial stuff, and it was just fun. It was just like pure fun. We kind of just thought them improv, and it was, it were, there was, I think at one point, we were like, oh, geez, this should have been a movie. <laughs> <laughs> I would watch that movie. Um, <laughs> I do want to ask a bit about Alan and uh, Park Posey. <laughs> Those characters are, are delicious uh, in every sense of the word, but, um, how, yeah, how did the character, this, those, specifically those characters, change from the script to how they appear on screen? Was there a lot of improv? There's so many, especially in Alan, so many little looks and tiny facial expressions that are so sassy and evil. I mean, that's just Alan. Alan's just fantastic. Um, I mean, like, you know, I scripted your light constantly. Oh, back up. There we go. Oh my that's gosh. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, Parker, I think, Parker signed on, I think, because Alan was doing it. They kind of came as a team. Like, Alan was interested in doing it, and then once Parker heard that Alan was going to kind of be her foil and community partner, she was like, okay, let's, let's do this. Because she was not, she was uncomfortable with the whole, like, you know, again, she was at the time was like the indie queen, and, you know, was kind of feeling torn about doing a movie like this. Yeah, she, she definitely, um, I think she felt like she was selling her soul a little bit. But it's such a delightful performance, and they're so good together. And she was a really good sport, you know, once she got into the character and figured out the wardrobe and realized that, 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 you know, there was there was something to be said there. We weren't just, like, making a comic book movie out of, you know, intellectual property to you know, make a money grab. It wasn't that long. No, definitely not. This is an awkward uh, segue, but have you watched Riverdale? <laughs> I, I, I watched one episode of Riverdale. <laughs> Well, my daughter was into it for like a minute. I couldn't, I didn't get it. Like, it's, why is there so much smoke in the school? It's like dark. <laughs> <laughs> why is there so much everything? I mean, why is Jughead so mad? Like, I didn't, I literally was like, I don't know what this is. And then there's a drug called Jingle Jangle. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Everyone's on Jingle Jangle. <laughs> yeah, I, so I feel like they're, they're just mad they didn't ask us. Well, their portrayal of Josie and the Pussycats, I feel like, feels indebted, at least to a degree, to, like, these gals. They're cool, determined, like, their Josie wants to be... No, I feel like she goes to, like, not NYU, she, like, leaves Riverdale to go be a star on her own or something. But enough about the CW Riverdale. <laughs> um, <laughs> such a privilege to be able to do both things. I 
hope you did. I'm, I'm, look, I've seen a couple of new musicals that are, are coming out. They're amazing. I'm glad people are going back. I hope we didn't kill it for so long. Or maybe it was just <laughs> a wave and we caught the tail end or whatever. But I'm, I'm glad it's coming back. You mean movie musicals? Movie musicals. Yeah. yeah. Which ones have you enjoyed? Uh, I just saw Cyrano. Uh, I tell you, I thought this movie was like a delight and so unlike anything you've seen in a long time. But you gotta like buy into Peter Dinklage singing. But it, all the songs were written by the National, and it's really like heavy and, and luscious. And Joe Wright directed it, and it's like it's really special. Like I haven't seen anything like that in a while. And then I just saw the trailer for West Side Story, and I'm all excited. And... Wow, I had no idea that the National were uh, working on that. That is very interesting. I wonder. Taylor Swift will uh, have a little moment. Um, What's the Taylor Swift National? Oh, <laughs> Taylor Swift worked with uh, Aaron Desner, who's in the National, on her two new albums, and she, coinc I mean, it's kind of coincided with her in a new, oh God, I hope there aren't any like, Swifties out here who are like, that's wrong! <laughs> um, but she kind of entered like a new phase of her songwriting, or, really kind of like got back to her roots through working with Aaron Desner and I don't know, it seems like a very wholesome collaboration. So <laughs> yeah, they're learning from each other. But um, yeah, that's a funny note to end on. The national. <laughs> but I really do want to thank you guys for coming and for making this movie. It, you know, really paid off at the end, even if it didn't seem like that at the moment, but it means a lot to a lot of people. Thank you so much. That's really nice. Thank you, guys. Thank you.